بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا ونفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وعملا يا كريم All praises belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's assistance And we seek His guidance subhanahu wa ta'ala And we seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala From the evils of our souls And the adverse consequences of our deeds Whomsoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees guidance upon Then none can misguide that person and whomsoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees misguidance upon, then none can guide him. And peace and salutations be upon the final messenger, Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. My dear brothers and fathers and mothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm not sure if it's very common for everyone to flank the speaker, but if it's possible to fill up some of the space in the middle, that would also be beneficial, firstly for myself, so it saves me from turning too much to the right and the left all the time, and alhamdulillah, the brothers in the middle can feel your brotherhood. Jazakumullahu khairan. Just to inform you, I lost my voice a day or a day and a half ago, and uh, alhamdulillah, it's come back, walillah alhamd, but there's still a few issues with some of the chords but we'll try and be as audible and clear as possible with Allah Ta'ala. Uh, from the outset, I'd like to express my delight at being here in Wales, in Cardiff. It's my first trip ever here. But it looks the same as the rest of the UK, mashallah. And I'd also like to express my gratitude to this wonderful masjid for their wonderful invite and to IDEA for facilitating this trip and to you all for your attendance this Sunday afternoon. I know it's difficult on a Sunday to invest time. We don't say sacrifice time, we say invest time. To invest time and attend these kind of talks. It's not a flourishing culture, but inshallah we'll get there. Inshallah we'll get there, especially on afternoons when Liverpool and Manchester United have matches against each other. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our efforts to make this a gathering that is forgiven upon its departure and to make this a gathering that hears a good word and follows it. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reunite us many, many more times in this world as well as reunite us in the hereafter. Amin. The title of today's talk is High Aspirations or as we heard our brother who introduced the program say ulu al himma having high aspirations and this is the third talk of a series called making our mark making our mark so it was a series titled around the theme of encouraging action especially in the programs that would have been conducted or are going to be conducted here in the southwest we began this journey in Bath and the topic was titled The Importance of Having a Vision. And we went on to Bristol and we discussed the importance of leadership and shared some examples from the lives of the first generation, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum ajma'in. And today we have this title which is also important as all the others, the title entitled high aspirations. Now, this particular topic is not something new for Islam and the Muslims. It's not a discussion that we find only being discussed in the century that we live in. For all praises belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who made us from amongst those that declared his oneness and from amongst those that accepted the prophecy of Muhammad ibn Abdullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam This declaration and this acceptance that by default has to make us people of high aspirations 
Thus Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said لِمِثْلِ هَذَا فَلْيَعْمَلِ الْعَامِلُونَ لِمِثْلِ هَذَا For this, this paradise Let those who strive, strive And inshallah we'll discuss this ayah a little bit more later And indeed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is deserving of praise for he taught this ummah that Jannah has levels has levels and in some narrations 100 levels 100 levels and he said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam فَإِذَا سَأَلْتُمْ اللَّهِ فَاسْأَلُوهُ الْفِرْدَوْسِ that when you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this paradise don't just ask for any paradise rather ask for the highest of paradise and that is al-firdaus so here rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is nurturing us to be people of high aspirations don't settle for anything less than the best strive to ascertain and attain the best and rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he described this al-firdaus to be that part of jannah that covers the middle part of Jannah until the highest part. And this hadith is in Sahih al-Bukhari. My dear brothers and sisters, this is manifest, or that which we've shared makes manifest, that this concept of ulu al himma is not something new. It was part of the package of Islam. It is something that enters our life the moment we declare the shahada. The moment we declare the shahada, it makes us people who are part and parcel of the concept of high aspirations. Because ulu al himma and high aspirations is part and parcel of Islam. And when we look in the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and when we read the books of Rijal, and look at what the scholars of hadith have written about those who came in the first generations of Islam, and those happenings in their life, we cannot help but acquire the knowledge that they were people full of high aspirations. And how can this not be? How can this not be when the prize for the believer is Jannah? The prize for the believer is Jannah. And as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam described this Jannah, he said this Jannah is expensive. Thus he said, أَلَا إِنَّ سِلْعَةَ اللَّهِ غَالِيَةً In a hadith in At-Tirmidhi, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, it's reported by Abu Hurairah رضي الله عنه ألا إن سلعة الله غالية The merchandise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is expensive. It requires your resources, your time, and your wealth. And this is a reality. The merchandise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is expensive. It will cost you. And your time to earn this expensive merchandise is your time in this world before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes us to him. My dear brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created life and created death. And in Surah Al-Mulk, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا To test you, to make manifest which one of you is the best in deeds is the forerunner in earning the hereafter. لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ Best in deeds. This by default requires any aspiration or high aspirations. What does it require from us? Higher aspirations. Which one of you is best in deeds? لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made Jannah into levels, into stages to reward people based on their aspirations and achievements. Because reward is directly proportional to effort. Right? This is a principle found in management. The outcome and result is proportional to effort applied. And the same thing applies. This concept is common sense. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward us based on effort. al jazaa min jinsil amal. The reward is based on the effort applied. Thus it was from the complete justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
that he even made Jannah into levels to reward people based on their effort. Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal al Wahid al Qahar. Now, for us, brothers and sisters, our aspirations differ from one person to the next. But for us, we have to realize that these aspirations become raised and they become lowered based on one concept. And that concept is our Iman. We have to realize this. For us, it's Iman. For the disbelievers, it's something else. Because their understanding of life and death is different to our understanding of life and death. So our ability to achieve and acquire and ascertain and our ability to aspire to be inspired and become inspired is based on our Iman. And our Iman grows, becomes passive, sometimes it's dynamic, sometimes it stays static, based on our connection to the hereafter. Because you and I, we're not just bodies, but we are bodies with spirituality. There's two elements to us. We are a body and we are a spiritual entity as well. And this is important, we must understand this. And both entities require nurturing and being looked after. Even in our ibadah, today many a time a person asks and say, we see people fasting the month of Ramadan. But on the day of Eid, they are engaged in vice. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ That this fasting is a means of acquiring taqwa and God consciousness and erecting a barrier between you and the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how can this be that a person fasts the month of Ramadan and spends the night in Qiyam worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then comes the day of Eid and they celebrate Eid in a manner contradictory to the teachings of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Here in the UK, how many a time do we hear of non-Muslims having to leave their cities and their towns on the day of Eid because they fear the disturbance by the Muslims in the celebration of Eid wal Iyadu Billah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Amin. So many a time these questions come about that how is this possible? How is it possible that a person observes salah? Was tanha anil fahsha'i wal munkar. That salah puts an end to that which is immoral and that which is disliked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How is it that a person can observe salah but they engage in riba and backbiting and slandering and vice? How is it possible? And the answer to this question is simple, O servants of Allah. And O children of Adam, there is no contradiction in the Sharia. And there is no ayb and defect in the evidences of the Sharia. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said is a fact. Ramadan is so that perhaps we can attain a taqwa. And salah is so that we can be protected against vice. And that which is immoral. But the problem lies in the effort itself whereby our ibadah becomes physical and lacks spirituality. It becomes an adah, a norm and lacks the concept of it being an ibadah, a worship. So we raise our hands in takbiratul ihram, but our physical body is doing so. But our heart and soul is void of what's happening. We fast the month of Ramadan with our bodies. We experience thirst and hunger and perhaps lose weight. But we start the day fasting physically, whilst our hearts and spirituality doesn't start the day fasting. Subhanallah. We concentrated on the lesser and forgot about the greater. Yes, we two entities, but the greater is the spirituality. So coming back to our earlier point, this Iman, O servants of Allah and O children of Adam, it shines and illuminates and raises our aspirations based on our attachment to the hereafter. And this is a fact. There's no way you can be attached to this dunya and at the same time be attached to the hereafter. It's a seesaw effect. The closer you are to one, the further you are to the other. The closer you are to one, you see your paradigm shifting. They start changing. The way you view life changes. Things that were beloved to you suddenly become disliked. And things that you never cared about automatically become matters that you care about. 
as you attach yourself to the hereafter, you become detached from the dunya. Because our attachment to the hereafter causes the heart to become soft and causes the soul to become alive. Look at the month of Ramadan, La ilaha illallah. We fast and by physically being starved, we actually feed our spirituality or we should be feeding our spirituality. To feed the soul, the body has to starve. Imagine this. You distance yourself from the dunya, the food and drink and marital relations, for a portion of the day, and immediately what, what starts becoming fed? Our spirituality, our iman, our heart. It becomes softer. It's being fed. Whilst the physical starves, the spiritual is being fed, subhanAllah. This is a fact. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Hadid, and you might have heard this in a talk of mine previously, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَلَمْ يَعْنِ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَن تَخْشَأَ قُلُوبُهُمْ لِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَمَا نَزَلَ مِنَ الْحَقِّ وَلَا يَكُونُ كَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ قَبْلِ فَطَالَ عَلَيْهِمُ الْأَمَدِ فَقَسَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ Subhanallah. Let's ponder over this ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, has a time not come for the believers to have hearts filled with khashyah. And khashya is not just fear, that's khawf. Khashya is fear plus ilm. Fear with knowledge. You fear whilst knowing why you fear. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاء This is the evidence that khashya is inclusive of ilm, of knowledge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that truly, the ones that have khashya are the ulama, those who are knowledgeable. They don't fear without knowing. They have knowledge as to why they're fearing and who they're fearing. La ilaha illallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us beneficial knowledge. Ameen. Ameen. We should ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to seek increased knowledge. Wa rabbi zidni ilma. So when we ponder over this ayah, we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, has a time not come for the believers to have hearts filled with khashya. Then Allah warns us against that which happened to those before us. And warns us against adopting the way of those before us. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? Don't be like those who came before you. What happened to them? فَطَالَ عَلَيْهِمُ الْأَمَدِ They became victims of time. They became attached to this life. And what happened as a result of becoming attached to this life? Their hearts became hardened. This is the net result. This is what happens. The more you are attached to this world, the less your spirituality is attached to the hereafter. The more you are attached to financial standing and material well-being and the glitter and glamour of this temporary life, the net result and effect of this is a hardened heart. Allah tells us in Surah Al-Hadid, they became victims of time and started chasing this life what was the net result? Qasat qulubuhum, their hearts became hardened. Wa kathirum minhum fasiqun. And most of them were sinners. This is the result of a hard heart. But we should never lose hope because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I'lamu, know and understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yuhyi l'ardh ba'da mawtiha. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give life to barren land after it's dead. So as Allah can give life to dead land, He can give life to your dead heart. Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la. So this is the reality, brothers and sisters, that our aspirations grow and cease based on our attachment to the hereafter, based on our Iman. This is a fact. It's, you cannot say, because Iman necessitates belief in Allah and his malaika, his angels, and his books, and his prophets, and the last day, and the day of judgment. How can you believe in the day of judgment but behave in a manner contradictory to this belief? How can your aspirations act in a manner that contradicts this belief of yours? You know you will return to Allah. And belief in the last day necessitates belief in death and the grave. Everything with regards to the hereafter. And the hereafter starts when we pass away. So how can you have Iman and believe in these entities but have aspirations that contradict the reality of this belief? Remember, Iman is belief. And it entails action. 
It's not just talking the talk, but it's walking the talk as well. It has to show in our actions, in our speech, in our hearts as well as our actions. So understand this, O servants of Allah and O children of Adam. Islam set high aspirations, but we differ in terms of our aspirations based on this Iman. Now, in working towards making these aspirations a reality, we also see that people are of two types. We have those who, as I said, they talk, but they don't walk the talk. They say a lot of things, we need to start this and we need to do that, and we need to be concerned, and we need to, and we need to, and we need to, but they lack action. Their action is delayed from that which they say verbally. It's a type of irja, right? It's a separation. And ta'khir. And then we have a second group of people who don't speak, but their actions speak for them. They prove that they're high net worth individuals. Right? We always say we need to become high net worth. Who are the high net worth individuals? Let's get the Forbes magazine and look at the high net worth individuals. No, with Islam, we have a different take on what on the definition of being a high net worth individual is. So we have those that are high net worth individuals. Their actions speak louder than words. And we see them making a difference. We, see, we feel their aspirations. They are people who see and they're not just around wasting time, utilizing the resources of this dunya for other people to see them. They are people who do the seeing. Their actions speak louder than words. And this was prevalent in the time of Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. These people existed. For take, for example, the Bedouin, who went to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said, Ya Muhammad, O oh Muhammad, give me from this wealth that Allah has given you. For this wealth is Allah's and not your father's. This is a level of aspiration. And in retrospect, we have Rabi'ah. Ibn Ka'b al-Aslami radiallahu an, who went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells him ask what do you need? ask and he says I do have a request and my request is that I seek your companionship in Jannah la ilaha illallah look at this aspiration I seek your companionship in Jannah ulu wal himma Allahu Akbar. And then consider Abu Hurairah radiallahu an. Abu Hurairah, who was from the people of Sufa. He was impoverished. Those people who didn't have shelter, they didn't have clothes, they didn't have food. This was Abu Hurairah was from this group of people. They would stay in Masjid al Nabawi and they would seek ilm and worship. Once the booty comes to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he's distributing this booty. And people are asking and asking and asking. And Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu is watching. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knows that this is a person in need. So he turns to Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu and says, Ask, what do you need and I will give it to you. Look at high aspirations. Look at aspirations that transcend the sphere of this dunya. La ilaha illallah. Abu Hurairah radiallahu anh says, O oh, Prophet of Allah, I do have a request. And I will ask you for something. And I will only ask you for one thing. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, What is it that you, you need? What is it that you desire? Subhanallah. He says, I ask you to teach me that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught you. La ilaha illallah. Imagine this. He was indirectly asking for Jannah because he knew that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Man salaka tariqan yaltamisu fihi ilman sahala allahu lahu bihi tariqan ilal jannah He knew that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught that a person who treads the path of knowledge Allah will make his path to Jannah easier So he's asking Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for Jannah but via the means that will get him there Teach me that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught you and we know that Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu was a pillar in terms of the Sunnah during the era of the Sahaba and he narrated over 6,000 ahadith la ilaha illallah 6,000 narrations 
Never mind being a student, he became a teacher of the Ummah. Allah chose him to be a protector of the Sunnah. Radiallahu an. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gather us with him in Jannah. Ameen. Once a group of boys came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they were asking. Somebody wanted intercession. Somebody wanted some wealth. Somebody wanted Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to assist them in a difficulty that they were going through. And in this group there was one boy. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after dealing with this group turns to this boy. And says what do you need? He says... He didn't want to speak in front of the jama'ah, in front of the gathering. He says, I want a private sitting and discussion with you. There's something that I need, but it's private. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after helping the group, goes on to him and says, what is it that you require? Is which, what is the amenity that you need? And this young boy tells Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I want your companionship in Jannah. Subhanallah. This was amongst the youth. I'm sharing an example from a Sahabi who was senior, and now here a young boy. They had high aspirations. This was what was inculcated within them when they said, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. So we need to ponder over these examples, my dear brothers and sisters. We need to ask ourselves, where are we from these examples? Let's benchmark ourselves. Where is our bar set at? How are we with regards to those who walked this earth and were praised by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Surely they have to be our benchmark. If we want to know whether we are upon goodness or not, we have to benchmark ourselves against them. We need to look at what their lives were about and ask ourselves, are we upon the same peril or not? And when we ponder over this, it makes us understand the reality of the person that we ask about sometimes that subhanallah that person in the middle of winter he can get up and go to the masjid for salah even though he didn't hear the adhan he goes to the masjid for salah now we understand why he does so and based on what we've said we understand the person who is quick to engage in haram who does not look after the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who does not even stay away from the shubuhat He's, he doesn't mind engaging in the shubuhat those gray areas yesterday in Bristol we discussed Abu Bakr radiallahu an and Abu Bakr radiallahu an once or oh, he had a habit of always asking his slave whenever he prepared a meal he asked him where did you pre from which money did you prepare this meal and one day he forgot and he began eating and the slave then said, but you didn't ask me the foundation of this meal that you have in front of you. The background behind it. So Abu Bakr said, where did you get this meal from? Where did you get the money to prepare this from? And he mentioned that he got it from a practice that he did during the days of ignorance when he practiced fortune telling. And this is haram. He practiced fortune telling. Forecasting matters of the ghaib. What does Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu do? Not only does he stop eating what's in front of him, he puts his finger in his mouth and vomits that which he consumed. Subhanallah. This is high aspirations. We understand why he did so. Even though, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. Allah doesn't ask from us that which is beyond us. رفي القلم الثلاث. And from them is the ignorant person who didn't know. But here Abu Bakr removes that which he consumed. This is high aspirations, O servants of Allah. And O children of Adam. We always have two types of people and no third. The first is a person who lives for the dunya. His aspirations are the dunya. His aspirations are the dunya, the lower, the closer. This is what dunya means, this world. And the second person is the one who aspires the akhirah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that these are the two types of people. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Minkum mayuridu dunya. Wa minkum mayuridu akhirah. Subhanallah. Two types of people. And when we think of this ayah, a story comes to mind. And that's the story of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. Do we know who Umar ibn Abdul Aziz was? No? Some of us do. Inshallah, we'll, we'll discuss a little bit. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz brothers and sisters, was from the men that walked this earth. 
He wasn't a man. He was from the men. We describe him as a rija. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him with a short but effective khilafah. And he was so successful in his khilafah that the scholars said he was from, or oh, he was the fifth rightly guided caliph. We know about the four. Abu Bakr, wa Umar, wa Uthman, wa Ali, radiallahu anhum ajma'in. They say Umar ibn Abdul Aziz was from them. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, in around two and a half years, this was the length of his khilafah. We can't even say he was just a successful leader. Because that would be taking away from that which he deserves. Today leaders lead one country. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz had 40 states under him. Rahmatullahi alayhi. 40 states under him. And he led it with justice and diligence and progress and security and safety. La ilaha illallah. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, it is said that before he took a position of authority, he used to tell his wife, Fatima, he used to tell her that I aspire to have a position of authority. And when he attained this position of authority, he said to her, I aspire to become the Amir of the Muslims, to become a Caliph. Look at the aspirations, constantly growing. And he achieved it. And when he became the successful leader, he turned to his wife and he tells her, I aspire for Jannah. La ilaha illallah. Look at high aspirations. High aspirations. And definitely he was from the caliber that could take leadership. We discussed this yesterday. Not everybody is cut out to be a leader. The Prophet wasallam refused Abu Dhar to take a position of authority because he was a soft person. But Umar ibn Abdul Aziz was a different person. He was capable of doing it. An honorable man with honorable aspirations. An honorable man with honorable aspirations. And you know what? On a side note, we learn two things from this. Firstly, that Islam makes it possible for us to utilize matters of this dunya for the benefit of our hereafter. Many of us say, you know, high aspirations means I need to become a sheikh. Oh, I need to be, I need to work in the da'wah. I need to, I have to have a direct function in the da'wah. This is the only way I can have high aspirations. I can't become a doctor and a lawyer. I can't be a professional runner, for example. Absolutely not. This doesn't stop you from having high aspirations. For Islam gives you the opportunity to make all these acts an act of worship. Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la. Going to school becomes an act of worship. Today, we say the worst day of the week. If you ask any young boy, he says Monday. And what's the best day of the week? Friday. And not any young boy, even the adults, because of work. Right? We say, what's the best day of the week? Friday. Why? Because the next day there's no school. And what's the worst day? Sunday. Why? Because the next day is Monday. Tayyib. What if going to school was a means of building your Jannah? And going to work was a means of building your Jannah. And for our mothers at home, cooking for your families was a means of building your Jannah. And nurturing the home was a means of building your Jannah. What if it became that? Could you become depressed? No. The worst day of the week would be Friday because the next day there's no school. Now obviously I'm talking in context of the country we live in. Otherwise the best day of the week is Friday. Afdalu yawmin tala'at alayhi shams. Yawmul Jumu'ah. The best day upon which the sun rises is the day of Jumu'ah, as is in uh, Sahih Muslim, and the report by Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu. So, what we're saying is, imagine if all these normalities of our daily life became an act of worship, became a means of building our Jannah, became a means of making our scales of good deeds heavy on the day of Qiyamah. This is the opportunity Islam gives us. If you make your work for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We learned this from Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz was asked, how did you achieve all this in such a short amount of time? How? And he answered this question. He said, there was nothing that I did except that I did it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing. When he aspired to take a position of authority, it wasn't for his sake. It is for the sake of Allah. And then when he aspired to become the leader of the Muslims, it wasn't for himself. It was for Allah. And when he aspired to ascertain Jannah, it was for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He made his life a waqf, an endowment. He gave it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is how you and I can also make our lives of higher aspirations. That you in your daily life, 
you can be a high aspirer. If you say, I'm going to work to earn financial standing so that I can pay zakah and I can increase sadaqah so that I can assist the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Isn't this a high aspiration? Whereas the non-Muslim is going to work for the sake of the weekend and the practices that we see prevalent during the weekend. Low aspiration. A person who goes to study medicine so I can represent this field in the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Aspire, achieve for the sake of Allah and every day of your life becomes an ibadah. Us sitting here as well. If we came here for the sake of Allah, it's an ibadah. And I always try and remind the audience at the beginning of every speech that make sure you're not here to learn. Now, somebody might say, but hold on a second. I came with my book and my pen to learn. MashaAllah, people are writing. How can it be that you're telling us don't come to learn? Yes. Don't come to learn. Come to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The how of that worship is through education. The learning will come. وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَيُعَلِّمُكُمُ اللَّهَ Be God conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will teach you. Fix that intention. Become a high aspirer in your intention. Make it solely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Live la ilaha illallah. Live it. That there is no one worthy of worship besides Allah. Everything I do is for the sake of Allah. Before I do or say anything, I will ask myself, is it beloved to Allah? If so, I will do it. If not, I will stay away from it. This is what high aspiration refers to. And as we discuss the story of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, an ayah comes to mind, and that is the ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, تِلْكَ الدَّارُ الْآخِرَةِ نَجْعَلُهَا لِلَّذِينَ لَا يُرِيدُونَ عُلُوًّا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا فَسَادَةِ وَالْآقِبَةُ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this, this dar of the akhirah is for those who did not live their life in this world to attain higher positions in this world for themselves and create fitna and fasad in the land. And the good ending is for those that are God conscious. My dear brothers and sisters, I shared with our brothers and sisters in the southwest over the past few days many lessons that contain this concept of being a high aspirer and achieving that which is better and greater. Because this is the reality. Islam came to make us the best. Islam came to remove this word known as mediocrity from our vocabulary. This is a fact. And I shared with them that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gave us the best book, the Quran. And He gave it to us via the best angel, Jibreel alayhi salam. And he gave it to the best messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he revealed it in the best month, the month of Ramadan. And on the best night, the night of power, Laylatul Qadr. And in the best language, the Arabic language. And in the best place, Makkah al Mukarramah. And in this book, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat nas. That you are the best of people. Allah gave us the best of everything. So how does mediocrity become part and parcel of our lives? How does this concept of us being low achievers become part and parcel of our lives? It can't be. For Allah has created us for Jannah. Now remember that ayah we discussed at the beginning, which was the ayah. هذا فليعمل العاملون. This ayah is an ayah in Surah Al-Safat. Allah says, for this, let the strivers strive. What does this mean? This is described in the ayat before it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Illa ibad Allah al But not the chosen servants of Allah. Meaning retrogression. A bad ending. A life of low achievement. This is not for who? Ibad Allah, who al mukhlasin the sincere servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ulaik lahum rizqum ma'loom. Those, they will have a provision determined. Fawakih, wahum mukramoon, fruits, and they will be honored. Where? Fi jannatin na'im, in gardens of pleasure. Ala sururim mutaqabileen, on thrones facing one another. يُطَافُ عَلَيْهِمْ بِكَأْسٍ مِّنْ مَعِينٍ 
there will be circulated amongst them a cup with contents from a flowing spring. White and delicious to the drinkers. No bad effect is there in it. Nor from it will they be intoxicated. And with them will be females, women, limiting their glances with large, beautiful eyes. As if they are delicate eggs, well protected. We know that the chick is born in an egg and the egg's job is to protect it. It's delicate. The chick is delicate. And the egg protects it. It's that box which provides it with protection. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, as for these females, they resemble this concept. As if they were delicate eggs well protected. And they, meaning, they will approach one another, inquiring of each other. The people of Jannah will approach one another, inquiring of each other. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, a speaker amongst them will say, Indeed, when I used to live on earth, I had a companion. Yaqul, a'inna musaddiqeen, who would say, are you indeed of those who believe? A'idha mitna, wa kunna turaban, wa idhaman, a'inna lamadinun? Subhanallah, this person used to say that when we have died and become dust and bones, will we indeed be recompensed? be brought to task for that which we used to do? Is this possible? Do you believe this as a reality? قال, هل أنتم مطلعون? He will say, would you care to look? فطلع فرآه في سواء الجحيم And this person will look for that companion. And where will he find him? Amidst the hellfire. قال, تالله إن كت لتردين He will say, by Allah, you almost ruined me. And if it was not for the favor of my Lord, I would have been of those brought in to the hellfire. Then are we not to die? Except for our first death, and we will not be punished. Indeed, this Jannah that, we are, that this person will be in, he will say, indeed, this is a great attainment. This is the prize for who? The high aspirer. Thus Allah says in the ayah after that, لِمِثْلِ هَذَا فَلْيَعْمَلِ الْآمِلُونَ It is for this Jannah, O servants of Allah, and it is for this Jannah, O children of Adam, that you should strive, that the strivers should strive. Never ever set your bar low. Always set it high. I told the brothers the other day, about a saying in the English language by Michelangelo. He says, the travesty is not in setting your bar high and not achieving your goals. The travesty is in setting your bar low and achieving it. Because you become complacent. Once you start achieving, you become complacent and you say, I've done. You enter a state of delusion. Set high goals. Aim the sky. In fact, aim the moon, because there's footprints on the moon, right? There's footprints on the moon. Raise your aspirations. This is what it's about, O servants of Allah. Don't just say, I'm going to become a doctor. Say, I'm going to be the best doctor. Don't just say, I'm going to be a lawyer. Say, I'm going to be the best lawyer. Don't just say, I'm going to become a hafiz. Say, I'm going to be the best hafiz. Don't just say, I'm going to contribute to this conference. Be the best contributor. Do it for the sake of Allah, and do it properly. This was the way of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, O servants of Allah. And we say Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we believe in him as the final messenger. Thus let's adopt from his sunnah, from his way. He was a perfectionist in everything that he did. And everything he did, he did it with the highest of aspirations. If we take one example from his life sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the example of him being a da'i, which was the prerogative behind him being sent. We see that he had the highest aspirations in that as well. We know he used to cry if a person passed away upon shirk. By Allah, ask yourself. Let us ask ourselves. When last did we cry? 
for a person who died upon shirk. When last did we cry when our neighbor never observed salah in the masjid? When last did we cry when our friends missed their salah altogether? When last did we have a sleepless night when our brothers and sisters in another country are suffering? When last? By Allah, let us ask ourselves. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam cried when one person would pass away upon shirk. He didn't want to be any da'i. He wanted to be the best da'i that everyone died upon Islam sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Thus Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him فَلَا تَذْهَبْ نَفْسُكَ عَلَيْهِ بِحَسَرَاتِ That do not let yourself perish over these disbelievers, over them in regret that they deny your message. Do not, do not let yourself perish. Subhanallah, look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes his situation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees him in depression. Why? Because they're not accepting the message, that which is good for them. He set the bar so high that he could not accept their denial of the message. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was to strive. It's not like you and I today. We say, khalas, we told him, let him learn the hard way. Today we leave a person, isn't it? That's what we do. We tell him once, tell him twice, and say, khalas. Lakum deenukum waliya deen. Right? You learn the hard way. It's either you listen and learn properly, or we will talk tomorrow and... <laughs> This wasn't the case with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Thus Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes his situation. Do not make yourself die and perish in regret over the situation. But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would. Thus in Surah Al-Kahf, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? فَلَعَلَّكَ بَاخِعُ النَّفْسَكَ أَيْ قَاتِلُ النَّفْسَكَ That perhaps you will kill yourself over these people's denial of your message. This was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The highest aspirations. Remember, our goals, our objectives are based upon our aspirations. When you set your goals, and it happens, you ask somebody, what do you expect to get in your exam? He says, you know, if I get 80%, I'm happy. Why did he say 80 and not 90? Because that's the level of his aspiration. You ask the next person, he goes, no, it has to be 95. But 85 is an A. He goes, I know, but 95, that's my, that's my goal. Why? Because he has a higher aspiration. Like I tell the brothers and the sisters studying Islam, I don't settle for 80%. Because you're going to be teaching the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do you want to teach it at the level of 80%? It's an amana. You should aim for the best. And if your aspirations are high, it might mean that you have sleepless nights studying. It might mean that you traveling to a sheikh for extra lessons. It might need that. But the person who's settling for 80, immediately we see everything around him settle upon his desire for 80. The one who wants 95 goes to school after school, he's going for extra lessons. The one who wants 80 goes to school after school, goes to sleep. Right? All, it's all tied. Your goals, your targets, your objectives, all this is based on your aspirations. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had such a high aspiration that it almost harmed him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was dedicated and concerned. Thus he stood on Safa and he announced Tawheed and he was cursed by Abu Lahab. Then he didn't stop there. He went into the markets of Mecca and called to Tawheed and they threw sand on his face. And he never stopped there. Thus he went to Ta'if and invited them to Islam and they stoned him until he bled La ilaha illallah and he never stopped there. Subhanallah. Such high aspirations sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then he was offered to have the city of Ta'if destroyed but he chose to make dua that their progeny become believers sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Such high aspirations La ilaha illallah. Wallahi wa ma arsalnaka illa rahmatan lillah alameen. Allah indeed was apt when he said to his Prophet wasallam, we have not sent you except as a mercy to mankind. Wasallam. My brothers and sisters, we know about ulul himmah. Nothing I'm saying here is foreign. But this sitting is just to revise that which we know and remind each other to that which we know. وَذَكِّرْ فَإِنَّ الذِّكْرَى تَنْفَعُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ 
in reminding one another there's benefit for us. Everything I've shared, it's something we know. But inshallah, it will act as a means of reviving something we forgot. And a means of us revising our resolutions, our yearly resolutions, our quarterly resolutions. The month of Ramadan came and went. How many of us have continued with those wonderful ibadat that we started in Ramadan? The Quran we used to read daily, has it continued? The Salat al-Duha that we began reading in Ramadan, has it continued? Looking after the Sunan al-Rawatib, has it continued? Asking the Masjid if it needs any help, has it continued? Or have we stagnated because of low aspirations? Understand this, O servant of Allah and O children of Adam. Benchmark yourself. I'll end off with an inspirational story. And that is the story of Ibn Umm al-Maktum, the blind Mu'addin of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This Sahabi radiallahu an was blind. He lacked sight, but he indeed had insight. He lacked sight, but he had Insight. Today we have people who have sight but they lack insight. Right? They have sight but they lack insight. We said the other day today we don't have people of vision. We have people of television. Right? This Sahabi was blind but he had insight. He was the Mu'addin and he loved Adhan and he practiced this concept of calling to the greatest worship, Salah. This Sahabi passed away after the battle of Qadisiyah, during the reign of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu an. And there's two narrations to his death, but I'll share with you one. I'll share with you one. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu an commanded the Muslims to form an army for the battle of Qadisiyah. And as Umar is checking the army, he sees this blind person ready radiallahu an for war. And Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anh, says, where are you going? He says, I'm going with the army. He says, but you're blind. You don't need to. There's no haraj upon you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran said, upon the blind person, there's no haraj. There's no haraj. You don't have to. He goes, I want to. So Umar said, what will you do there? He says, I will increase the number of Muslims on the battlefield. I will be a means of showing the enemy that we much more. Subhanallah. Ulu al himma. High aspirations. This is a blind man. Not saying, Allah, I'm blind. I'm sitting here. I'll see you when you get back. May Allah be with you. La. High aspirations. High aspirations. I'm going with them. Radiallahu an. And it is said that he passed away on the battlefield holding the flag, the liwa. The flag of La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. He died upon that, and that is how he will be raised on the day of Qiyamah. O servants of Allah and O children of Adam, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the understanding, to accept from us. There's a saying in the Arabic language. Man shaba ala shaymata ali. That whoever becomes old upon a habit will die upon that habit. Don't become old, except upon the habit of having high aspirations in your life. Don't forget Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa statement that don't ask for any Jannah, but ask for the best Jannah. Don't forget that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declared us to be the best of all nations. So let us be the best to our parents, to our children, to our spouses, to our teachers, to our communities, to every environment that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places us in. Let us become the makers of change and the shapers of change. Let us become people who see and not people who just take up space and are seen. Let us make things happen and not just watch things happen. Yesterday I told your brothers and sisters in Bristol that there's other people as well who have the habit of always saying, what happened? They don't make it happen. They don't see it happen. They're always uninformed. So when you speak about something, they go, hold on, hold on, hold on. What happened? Let us be people who make things happen 
and not people who watch things happen. Wallahi, the world and the ummah requires a revival. Let us take our rightful place and become the revivers. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept. Ameen. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Everything corrected is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and He is perfect. And any mistakes are from myself and shaitan. And I seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.